Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Oliver Creek Church of Christ Online. My name is Smith Hopkins, and I'm the preaching minister for Oliver Creek. If you don't know, our campus is located in Bartlett, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. And so if you're ever in our area, and especially if you live in our area, we would love to see you sometime soon. Once we get back worshiping and in class together on site, it would be a joy to have you. Thank you for joining us today. At Oliver Creek, our mission is the mission of God in Scripture, to be a church where people are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Here's what we think that looks like. It looks like people who glorify God with their lives and in worship. It looks like people who love one another and are connected like a family in Christ. And it looks like people who bless the world, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. That's what we're all about here at Oliver Creek. And we hope that this service today can help you be transformed into His image. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in a few minutes. The kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Hello, Oliver Creek Church of Christ. Welcome to our Sunday worship. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. We've got a lot of guests I know from all over the country. We welcome you as well. If you're ever in Memphis, please look us up. We'd love to meet you. Uh, we will be back at some point in our building, and we will let you know when that is. We can't wait to meet you. Last week, I kicked off a series called Amazing Grace, and you guys were so supportive. I don't think I've ever received as many just overwhelmingly encouraging comments and messages from people. I want to just say thank you for that. If you haven't listened, go check it out. But today we, we continue part two in our series, Amazing Grace. James Riddick is going to lead us in singing. We'll hear from our shepherds in a prayer. And of course, we'll take the Lord's Supper. If you don't have the bread in the cup, here's your warning. Go ahead and grab that. We thank you for worshiping with us. I pray that you will bring your whole heart to God today and worship as we lift up our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
What a song of delight in a city so bright would be wiped beneath heaven's fair dome. How the ransom would raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. As we sing here on earth, song of sadness on earth, gives us foretaste of rapture to come. But our joy can't compare with the glory up there when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foam. Every heart will be light, and his face will be bright, when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, There'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm found. And I know, I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty in power. I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, and I know, I know I can stand secure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, I put my hope in your holy word, I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, He who died. Heaven's gate will open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, 
Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me. I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I'll be reading from Titus, uh, chapter 3, or verses 3 through 7. At one time we were too foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when, kindness and love, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Have you ever been confused about the relationship between grace on the one hand and obedience on the other? I have. I've been in Bible studies and conversations where I've been accused of abandoning grace because I emphasized obedience. Or I could just point out Scripture's language connecting baptism and salvation, and someone would accuse me saying, no, you're, you're teaching a salvation by works, not by grace. It's confusing. It's challenging. I think there's two big myths that we sometimes buy into when it comes to the grace of God. And it's very important that we clear these up. The first myth is really what I dealt with last week. By the way, if you haven't listened to last week, maybe after the service is over, pull it up on YouTube or Facebook and check it out. But the first myth goes something like this. God's grace isn't free. God's grace is somehow deserved or merited or you have to be worthy. God's grace isn't for me because God's grace is only for good people. It's only for godly people. It's not for people like me. Or it's not for people like you. It's not for people as broken and sinful as you. This myth is that God's grace isn't free. But this is a myth. It is not the biblical teaching of the grace of God. The grace of God is the gift of Jesus Christ to the unworthy. It's the free gift of God. No one deserves this gift. It is unmerited. It is unearned. It is a free gift. But there's another myth that we sometimes believe, and it's almost the opposite. And sometimes these get intertwined. I want to take them on separately. If the first myth is that God's grace isn't free, the second myth is that God's grace isn't costly. God's grace isn't costly, we think. Because grace is free, it can't have a cost. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian living in Nazi Germany, he was actually executed by Hitler and the Nazis at the end of the war. He says this is grace without price, grace without cost. He called it cheap grace. He says, the essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance. And because it's been paid, everything can be had for nothing. He says, it's grace without repentance. It's grace without discipleship. It's grace without obedience. This is cheap grace. This is not biblical grace. Oh, but you can find this kind of grace on sale all over our country in churches, probably even today. There's a movement called the Free Grace Movement, the free grace movement, with some of America's most prominent preachers. One of them says this. He says, nothing can be by grace and by works at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. If God accepts us by grace, it cannot have anything to do with works of any kind. So what do we think of the relationship between grace and obedience? What I want to claim today is really just one central point that I'm going to unpack. It comes from the language of Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Let's read this together. Romans 1, 1 through 6 says, 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Today, what I want to claim is that God's grace, the gift of God's grace, demands our obedience of faith. The gift of God's grace demands our obedience of faith. Would you say that with me? The gift of God's grace demands our obedience of faith. Let's break that down. Let's look at the first half of this statement as our first point. The gift of God's grace demands. And I know this is a strange view. It's countercultural to how we think of grace and how we think of gift giving. We think the purest form of a gift is a gift with no strings attached. We think that in order to be grace, it can have no expectation of return. There's no obligation if it's really grace. This is a very popular conception, but the problem is it's a very modern conception. People didn't start thinking of gift giving like this until the 1500s, 1500 years after Paul was writing. It's a very modern understanding of grace. And so we need to recover an ancient picture of gift giving and grace if we're going to understand what the Apostle Paul means. Here's where a scholar named John Barclay in his book, Paul and the Gift, really helps us. He did a deep dive into his scholarship on how ancient people in And Jews, like Paul, thought of gift giving. Here's what he says. He says, The notion of a gift with no strings attached was practically unimaginable in antiquity. None of Paul's hearers would have been surprised to learn that as recipients of the divine gift, they were placed under obligation to God. Here's the reason. Modern people think of grace as a one-way benefit. Ancient people thought of grace is a mutual bond. You see the difference? I'm helping you. That's how we think of gift. But they thought of gift as creating a a network, a connection. In other words, to them, the purpose of grace was a relationship. So what would it look like to reciprocate, to return a gift in response to a gift of grace? Well, it happened all the time for a variety of things. There was a man in Corinth. He's actually named at the end of the letter to the Romans, Erastus. And what we see is that, there, it, actually, if you go and visit the city of Corinth today, there's a, a big plaque with Erastus' name on it. And it says, in exchange for us giving you this city council position, he paved this at his own expense. But what ancient historians help us see is that this gift of grace give him a position, was reciprocated. Then he paved it at his own expense. That gift of grace was then reciprocated. We'll put up a plaque with your name on it for all to see. Matthew Bates, he says, if somehow the city of Corinth refused to put up a plaque with Erastus' name on it, he said everyone would have known that Erastus was well within his rights of grace to tear up the pavement because they had rejected his gift. He, he puts it pretty plainly like this. He says, failure to reciprocate, to return a gift, meant the grace had been spurned. In the ancient world, if a gift is given, some sort of return gift must be given. If not, it sends a social signal that the initial gift has been rejected. Grace required a response. In other words, the gift of God's grace demands This is how grace works in the mind of Paul, in the mind of Jesus, in in the ancient world. Grace has demands. Now, it doesn't mean that you pay back the gift. They understood the difference between a loan and a gift. But it does mean that in a relationship, both parties now have some responsibility. That's really what we see all over Paul's writings about grace and gift. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts. 
really, the word is these grace things. God is giving graces, literally graces to his church. And there's a variety of graces, these gifts that he's given. He says, but they're all for the common good. They're to create bonds, relationship. He says that the purpose of a gift ultimately is love in 1 Corinthians 13. He says you can do all that you want, but if you do not go into love, you see the purpose of grace is love, connection. It's relationship in the mind of Paul. But we also see in Paul's writings, even in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Do you, do you see how he understands that when he receives the grace of Jesus Christ, it obligates him, it compels him, it has this demand on him. He says, I started working harder than anyone else. He says, but it wasn't me, it was the grace. So at, at once we have to say that God's grace is free and God's grace is costly. Cheap grace is a false myth. The reality is that God's grace demands. Here's an illustration that may help us think through this language of gift and grace and how grace demands, how grace builds in expectations to create a bond and a relationship. Remember the night that I proposed to Kelsey. I went through all these uh, sites in the city of Memphis that we had been on dates to on this really amazing carriage ride. And we stopped in front of the Orpheum downtown, and I had rented out the marquee, and it said, Kelsey, I love you now and forever. Will you marry me? And I got down on one knee, and I told her all the reasons why I loved her and I wanted to spend my life with her. And I offered her the most special gift I had ever given anyone. You see, the opposite of giving is not receiving. The opposite of giving is rejecting, right? The opposite of giving. Kelsey received that gift from me, and it made my heart so filled with joy and love. But because she received the gift, she was then compelled to return the gift. And so a couple of months later, we're standing at the altar exchanging vows, and I once again give her that most precious gift, and I offer her a ring. You know what she did? She gave me a ring. She returned a gift. Now, I've got to say, the ring she gave me wasn't near as nice as the ring I gave her. Do you see that that's not the point? She wasn't trying to repay me. She was trying to express a grace to me. This is how God's grace works too. The purpose of God's gift is not a one-way benefit. It is a relationship with the God who loves you. Yes, He demands something, but He desires that love and that, that, that grace from you, that response. I think this is a really amazing thing because it shows us that the opposite of giving is not receiving. The opposite of giving is just rejecting. There is a way to reject the grace of God. And it is when you do not respond with your own gift back to Him. So now let's turn our attention to the second half of our kind of thesis for today. We said that the gift of God's grace demands our obedience of faith. The gift of grace demands, we've made that point, but what is the demand? The language of Paul says, Grace demands the obedience of faith. In a word, it's pistis in the New Testament. It's faith. But we run into some problems when it comes to the language of faith. Because faith can mean so many different things. Faith can mean something like, well, I, I have a belief. I think that is true. But that's not at all what faith means in the New Testament. Faith is not believing in the truth of God's existence. Faith is not believing that Jesus died for your sins, as if that somehow erases your history of sin. No, faith is an embodied, it's a lived loyalty. 
Paul calls it in Romans chapter 1, the obedience of faith. And so in this extraordinary letter that Paul writes to this church, he says that by His grace, we've been, we've been adopted into the King's family. Whenever you see the language of Christ Jesus, Christ is the, this Hebrew concept of the King. He says, you've been adopted into King Jesus by grace. But why? What's the purpose? He says, it's for the sake of his, it's to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You belong to him. So you have to respond in the obedience of faith. Now, what does that look like? Well, that's, that's really the rest of the book of Romans. That's really, especially Romans 12 through 16. You want to know what obedience of faith looks like? It looks like a life that's not conformed to this world, but it's transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It looks like a life that's filled with this genuine love for each other. It looks like a love that lifts up the weaker, even when you happen to be stronger. It lifts up the ones who are wrong, even when you happen to be right. That's what he says in Romans 12 through 15. This is an amazing reality, the obedience of faith. This phrase shows up again at the end of his letter to the Romans. He says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. This is the whole reason for God's big plan is to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's faith. Loyalty. My favorite word for this is allegiance. You see, the response that we give to the gift of God in Jesus Christ is faithful allegiance to the King. You change your citizenship papers over. If you've ever known someone who was an immigrant who immigrated to the United States and they become a United States citizen, they have to actually take an oath of allegiance. It's something native-born citizens don't have to do. But they have to renounce all former nations and rulers and then pledge allegiance to the new constitution and this new nation. That's what faith is biblically. In order to receive the gift, you've got to pledge your allegiance to Jesus. To forsake all other kings and rulers and presidents and countries and nations and become a citizen of heaven. This is faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. Not affirming Jesus. This is not some inner psychological reality. It's this embodied life of loyalty to our King Jesus. What a gift. What an amazing concept. The amazing grace of God. It joins us into a new kingdom, into a new people, into a new church. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, how do I pledge my allegiance? I'm I'm glad you asked. What Paul says is that You pledge your allegiance to the reign of grace through baptism. It's it's when you go down into the water, reenacting the death and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, and you come up and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you do that, you're pledging your allegiance. But allegiance pledged is no allegiance at all, if if that's all. You, You may get wet. It may ease your conscience. But if there is not a life lived in faithful obedience to the king. He says, then you can fall from grace. Now we're going to talk more about what it looks like to live obediently, whether or not you can fall from grace. We'll look at that next week. So hold on to that question. But do you see that the grace of God demands the obedience of faith? So what would it look like to put obedience of faith in action? Well, there's not a list. Now, Paul can say, here's a biblically informed, a wise way of saying, here's some things you can't do. And he'll go through drunkenness and sexual sin of just these perverse things informed by Scripture that he's saying, let's stay away from these. They're like guardrails. Don't get close to the edge. But he also can give a list of things that we should do. He calls them the fruit of the Spirit. 
Really, that's what the obedience of faith is. It's a life lived, led by the Spirit of God rather than the flesh. It's not a life of perfection. It's a life of constant, what he calls, crucifixion of the flesh. It's where we're in a continual discipleship to Jesus, day after day, uncovering new parts of our heart that need turned over to Him, confessing our sins to each other and to Him, and then living on in the next day. It's not perfection, it's faith. It's the obedience of faith. He says it looks like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Against such, there's no law. That's what obedience of faith looks like. At Oliver Creek, we have six habits that I think really capture these. We call them the transforming graces because it's a major emphasis to us that grace doesn't leave you where you were. Grace has a transforming effect on your life. Grace has this demand, this expectation, and that if you don't respond with the expectation, then you forfeit the gift. Here they are. The first one is to give thanks. At the heart of the obedience of faith is a life of gratitude for the gift of Jesus Christ. The second one is to reflect on the Word. This is our our bread, our water, that sustains us through our, our life of discipleship. The third is to ask deeper questions. I think listening is a way of blessing other people in your life, but it's also a way of receiving a blessing from God when you slow down and consider Him and ask Him questions. To commune with God is a life of connection, of of prayerfulness, of, of a relationship. And what I've been trying to say is that that's the whole goal of grace, is communion with God and with others. Eat together, of course, we see this all over in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. But here's something striking that I think this new idea of grace helps us see more clearly. You see, grace isn't a one-way benefit. Grace isn't you always serving them food. It's not you always doing something on behalf of someone else, no strings attached. The purpose of grace is to bring people together. That's real hospitality in the Christian view. That's grace at work. Have you ever thought of how often Jesus was the guest in someone's home? A lot of us are so willing to serve, but we're so unwilling to receive a gift from others. What would happen if instead of avoiding these toxic manifestations of grace, we instead leaned into community. I think it would look like eating together. The last of the graces is to serve your neighbor, to serve your neighbor. Paul says that none of this rules and laws matter anymore. What matters is this, faith working itself out in love. Faith working through love. It looks like service to each other. This is the obedience of faith. It's not perfection. It's a life of discipleship in response to Jesus the King. Grace is both unmerited and to the unworthy. It is both free and costly. It is a gift to the unworthy in order to transform us into people who are living out the obedience of faith by the power of His Spirit. This gift is grace. Grace, it reciprocates. It gives a gift back, the gift of faith in Jesus. And it's nothing less, the Bible says, than a marriage. Except instead of me working all summer to pay off this ring that was this most precious gift that I offered, the gift of grace in Jesus Christ is God coming in the flesh. It's the costly gift of the life of the Son of God, stripped and naked, nailed to a cross, crucified for our sins. That's the cost of grace. But in the cost of grace, He calls us to Himself, not as just a one-way gift to erase our sins, but as a way of reconciling us to Himself and to each other. Oh, how beautiful this picture of marriage is in Scripture. Paul says that all marriage points to this reality of Christ and His church in loving union forever. I hope that you want to experience this grace. Because he says it calls you to live a life of faithful obedience. Would you pray with me?
Our Father, I pray that you give us the grace to live faithfully, that you help us as a church to live for one another, not just for ourselves, that we live in mutual love, uh, not just as, as one-way servants, that in, in our ministries, that we see that we are a, a body of parts working together, that in our families, that we see that none are higher or lower than anyone else, but all are undeserving recipients of this amazing grace. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, for his crucifixion, for his resurrection, for his ascension, and for his Holy Spirit. It's in his name we pray. Amen. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to While the lingering twilight fades, see that suffering friendless one weeping, praying there alone. When my love for man grows weak. When for stronger faith I seek, see His glory I go to Thy scenes of fear and woe. There behold His Suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his faith. La triumphant still in death. Then to life I turn Learning all the worth of pain, learning all the might and lies in a full self-sacrifice. Hello, I'm Jason Heckendorf, member here at Oliver Creek Church of Christ. Uh, we're just about to move into our communion service and just ask that you join with me. We are now about to move into an important part of our worship, the Lord's Supper. For, for us Christians, this is a time to glorify God and love one another. And it is a call to bless the world as we remember the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on the cross and to celebrate his resurrection. We invite all Christians here today to share in this together. In Luke 4, 16 through 21, and, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as, he, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He's, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of, to the blind and to, to, to set at liberty those who are opposed. I'm sorry, oppressed. To proclaim this, the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Please pray with me. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for us, sending your Son to die on the cross for us, Lord. Lord, we, we just can't fathom what was 
going through your mind and what was going through his as the sacrifice was made for us and the res the resurrection that was about to come. Lord, we just ask that we remember this as we take this bread and then remember how broken that we are, but that we have Jesus to be able to turn to each and every day to look to for our guidance and for our, our courage that we need each and every day. Amen. Please pray with me for the cup. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Father, again, we get to come to you. And Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice that was made for us and the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross to wash away our sins. And Lord, I just pray that as we go about our weeks, that we get to take part in this once a week, but that each and every each and every day that we that we sin and that we do things that we know are not in the light of Jesus, that we think about this. Though we know that we're forgiven, but that we strive to make ourselves transform, to be transformed in His image more and more each and every day. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's at this time that we get to have the opportunity where we get to give back uh, what was given to us by, by our Lord Jesus. And uh, you are not obligated to do this if you are a guest and visiting with us. And if you do feel compelled, we do appreciate that. This is meant for our members. There are three different ways that you can give. You can give on our website. Uh, but also on the screen, you'll see a QR code. You can scan that uh, with your smartphone and it'll take you right to our website to where you can give. The other way is that you can text uh, if you can just text in the, to the number on the screen, you can then it'll take you to how where how you're going to give there. Also, you can just do it the old-fashioned way, and you can just mail in a check. And we appreciate all of your generosity. Please pray with me, dear gracious heavenly Father. Father, it's at this time that we get to come to you and give back a portion of what we have earned because of you each each and every day. Lord, I just pray that we open our hearts and that we that we give in a very willing way and that we remember the sacrifice that was made for us and that we have much that we can sacrifice as all that we have is yours. Lord, I just pray that we take this money that is that is gathered and that we, we use this in a way that can help spread the words of Jesus and that we can expand scripture all over, but Lord, that we can continue to build up in, in our own church here as well as across the world. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm Paul Holt, one of the shepherds here at Oliver Creek. and We're glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Nothing would make us happier than if we were all gathered together this morning. We hope and pray that you've been encouraged, that you've been edified, and because of the sensitive nature of some of our prayer requests, you'll notice that we don't mention names. But know this, we're praying for you by name, and as a group, we love you and care for you. We urge you to stay safe, to stay connected, and to grow your faith in every way, every day. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, so many are, of us are weary, we're tired, and we're having difficulty during this time in our world. Father, the disconnect from our family, the disconnect from those that are sick, being away from our friends and not being able to meet together as a church family is taking its toll. Father, we ask for strength, strength to endure, and we ask for strength to withstand the temptation to quit, the temptation to be rude, the temptation to be selfish. 
Father, we pray for wisdom in dealing with others. And we pray for healing for those that are sick. And we pray especially for those that are dealing with employment issues and with those that are having difficulty coping. Father, we need your love and we need your word to win in this world. We need your peace and your understanding. Father, we pray that you will help us to continue to show love for our fellow man. Help us to be bold enough to be un unapologetic to be your children. Help us to show this world the love of your Son. And it's through His name that we pray. Amen.